Okay, folks, welcome back from the break. We're starting uh, a few minutes early, which is uh, sort of unusual at a conference. You usually start running behind uh, even before you start. Uh, so this is the first panel, and uh, the moderator is my friend and colleague, Esther Fuchs. Uh, we've been together at Columbia for many, many years, and I'm delighted to introduce her, and she will introduce the panel. So Esther is a professor of public affairs and political science, and she's director of the Urban Policy Program at Columbia University. She served as special advisor to the mayor for government and strategic planning, and you heard that he sometimes took her advice. Uh, Dr. Fuchs was chair of the Urban Studies Program at Barnard and at Columbia College, and founding director of Columbia University Center for Urban Research and Policy. She currently serves on the New York City's Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Board, the New York City Economic Opportunity Commission, the New York City Workforce Investment Board, the New York City Commission on Women's Issues. She is appointed to the Committee on Economic Inclusion of the FDIC and is on numerous other boards. Dr. Fuchs has published widely. She is a frequent political commentator in print and broadcast and new media. She received her BA from Queens College at the City University of New York, an MA from Brown University, and her PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Esther Fuchs. Just want to briefly welcome everybody back uh, to Lowe Library. Columbia University. Um, we're so delighted you're here this morning and that you've stayed and particularly a welcome to all of our international participants but a special hello to all my students who are here this morning. As Michael Bloomberg told us so eloquently, we're here to share knowledge. What better place to share knowledge than in a university? And the knowledge must be about how we successfully educate our children in all of our nations all over the globe. The premise of this summit and of the Global Partners Program is that we can all learn from each other. That sounds very simple, but it's just so important. Learning from each other at summits like this will really protect and develop the future well-being of all of our nations and our ability to educate our children really is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. So it's my pleasure, and really a great pleasure for me today, to introduce to you an extraordinary group of world-class educators. And our panel is about reforming public education systems. All our panelists are from global cities, and they have their fair share of challenges, but they also have some extraordinary successes. And this morning, I hope, after you listen, you'll have some serious questions for them because they will be willing to answer those questions. This panel especially will focus on some of the larger reforms in these cities, things that when we're worrying about what goes on in the classroom, we don't always think about. But as Mayor Bloomberg said, it's also about how we structure our education system, which really empowers principals and teachers, families and students to get it right in the classroom. What I'm going to do is uh, introduce each one of our panelists separately. They'll be speaking for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll take questions at the end. Our first panelist is Claudia Costin. Uh, Ms. Costin is Secretary of Education of Rio de Janeiro, a specialist in public policy, education, and poverty alleviation, and has extensive academic and technical experience and has served in many management roles in governments and NGOs in Brazil and in other nations. Some of those roles have included Federal Minister of State Administration and State Reform, Secretary of Planning and Evaluation of the Ministry of Finance, and she was also Executive Vice President of the Victor Civita Foundation, an organization devoted to the improvement of the quality of public education in Brazil. 
Ms. Costin studied public administration at uh, Guti, I'm not going to pronounce it right. You know, I studied <laughs> French in school. What a mistake. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, where she also obtained a master's degree in economics and credits toward her PhD in management. She also teaches at IBM EC SP Department of Economics. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the Secretary of Education of Rio de Janeiro, Claudia Costin. Good, mo good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm thankful for the, the kind invitation, and I want to compl compliment my uh, the, uh, Esther, uh, the Professor Esther Fuchs, my colleagues in Hooking, uh, Mamta Agarwal, and Johan Ara. Uh, in my 10 minutes, I it's very hard to explain such an extensive reform as the one we are doing in Rio. But just to quickly summarize, um, we are in charge of 1,064 schools, uh, 300 nursery schools and in our system. We uh, work with nursery t till ninth grade and the state is devoted to high schools. Uh, we have uh, a very huge system that is considered uh, the biggest uh, school system, municipal school system in the country, although we are not the biggest city. And we had lots of problems related to social promotion and the effects and the consequences that social promotion brought to our schools. Uh, just to give one figure, from our 700,000 kids, 28,000 from fourth, fifth, and sixth grades were ir illiterate. They were in sixth grade, they were studying for a long time, and they were still illiterate. So uh, we had the impression that many problems were swept under the carpet not learning, uh, de learning deficits, and so on. So uh, when we took office, when the mayor took office and invited me, it was one year and 10 months ago, we, uh, and after a quick assessment of, uh, of learning on how schools were evolving, Brazil has very recently universalized the access to elementary school education and then quality was an issue in all the cities um, we decided to do a, a diagnose, diagnostic test and then take action and one of the most challenging situations that we dealt with apart from the general low quality was the fact that in uh, drug lord controlled areas and militia controlled areas. We had 150 schools uh, where learning was almost impossible. Uh, those schools were the only presence of the state in those areas. And although a process of uh, occupation and pacification of those slums, those favelas, was happening. Uh, still, it was difficult for teachers to teach and kids to learn. So we developed a program called Schools of Tomorrow. While we were reshaping the whole system in every school, in those schools we took additional steps. Let me first explain very quickly what we did in all the schools. We established a unified curriculum that all schools had to follow, but that was organized on a bimestral basis so that teachers would know exactly what was supposed to be teached in each subject area in each grade. While remedial education was, was being provided 
for re-alphabetizing the kids that were illiterate, uh, accelerating the kids that were over age. Uh, we were organizing the curriculum on a bi-monthly basis and training teachers to be able to do that. And so while everything was going on that side of the general approach, which was a non-excuse approach, but also a very supportive approach. We, this, uh, we took the schools of tomorrow, the schools in the drug controlled areas, and there we had, uh, we established seven pillars. First, on those areas, school was all day long, from 7.30 to 5 in the afternoon, full-time education with lots of arts, sports, and school reinforcement for those kids. Second, we put in place a science lab in each classroom. We took a very experimental approach to teaching science that would make kids want to go to school every day because school evasion in these areas are, is horrible. So they leave school to work for the drug lords. So we wanted them to love going to school at the same time as we were becoming more demanding with them. Uh, we decided also to train each teacher on how to give classes that are more dynamic and more prone to fight the, blo the, the cognitive blockages that uh, derive from overexposure to violence. Uh, we had a specialist that trained all our teachers in this 150 uh, school. And also um, a, re a health program, because in those areas there are no health services. So although we cannot afford to have health services in every one of the 1,064 schools, at least in those 151 schools, we do have, um, we deliver a health, a health program. Uh, also, not only treatment, but also uh, prevention. In those areas, we have a huge problem with, um, with teenage pregnancies, because the girls feel that to be protected a good shortcut would be to become pregnant of an authority from the drug, uh, the narco traffic. So uh, just, uh, we have uh, also established targets for every one of the 1,000 schools, but if we achieve the targets, so uh, we made schools accountable for improving learning, but if the school achieve a target, a given goal, uh, in those areas, they received an incremented bonus. So every school received bonus, the team, the school team received bonus if they achieved the target, but in those specific 150 schools, the bonus is much higher. Uh, because teaching there is so challenging. Uh, we have already results to present. In one year and 10 months, our index, there is an index that measures learning in Brazil. Our index had risen uh, in a very impressive way. And from the 290 schools that achieved their target, that reached their goals, 53 of them are schools of tomorrow. So they did great with the same teachers, not charter school system, just our, our regular teachers, just investing in three things. One, uh, communicating with them regularly, strongly. Second, motivating them, saying that, uh, yes, they can, uh, they can retain kids, that's not our aim, but we can. And third, uh, giving the correct rewards, showing that 
yes, sorry to take this word from the states in a different context. Yes, we can, we can change education. <laughs> yes, we can, we can give another kind of life. We can give a tomorrow for those kids. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. For those of you who are in, the, in other parts of the country uh, and world who thought you had problems, what an, extraordinary, what an extraordinary story you've told. What an amazing achievement. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Johan Ora, who is the director of the Finnish National Board of Education. This is the national agency subordinate to the Ministry of Education of Finland. He's responsible for the Swedish education sector. For some of you who don't know, Finland has two official languages, Swedish and Finnish. Um, and so he has a particular challenge in his job of dealing with the issues of multiculturalism and dual language. He has a background in elementary, as an elementary school teacher in all subjects and a high school teacher of physical education. He's also worked as a principal for six years and as a superintendent for three years. At the Finnish board, he's responsible for the development of education in the Swedish-speaking schools in Finland, all through pre-primary and basic education, general upper secondary education, adult education, and basic education in the arts. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in this uh, presentation I will speak about a proposal concerning the renewal of basic education in Finland. As you all probably know, the Finnish education system, especially the comprehensive school, is known for its excellent learning outcomes. In the PISA assessment 2000, 2003, 2006, Finnish 15-year-olds have been on the top in all studied domains, reading literacy, mathematics, natural science, and problem-solving sol knowledge and skills. The quality of learning is high in all Finnish schools. There are very small differences between schools in learning results. Practically, all students complete their compulsory education. Even though we are doing well, we are planning a big renewal of basic education in our country. We know that the world is changing and that the results cannot stay high if we do, if we do not change too. Therefore, the Ministry of Education set a parliamentary committee in spring 2009 to formulate a proposal for the distribution of lesson hours, the minimum number of hours to be taught in each subject, and the general national objectives for the new Basic Education Act. The committee submitted its proposal in June 2010. In addition to the proposal on the distribution of lesson hours, the committee also made a proposal for the renewal of basic education as a whole. The aim of the new proposal is to develop basic education and its objectives in a consistent way by taking into consideration the present strengths of basic education and development needs for the future. The Finnish, in Finnish, policymaking is based on evidence and consultation of all stakeholders. Therefore, the starting point com committee's work was collecting evidence based on national and international research and indicators. Also stakeholders were heard, including pupils who were interviewed. As mentioned earlier, the committee set future objectives for the renewal of basic education as a whole. These demonstrate the committee's view of the mission and integrity of basic education in the future Finnish society. I will now outline the committee's proposal according to the four objectives of the renewal, namely to clarify and enhance the mis mission and integrity of basic education, to ensure the high level of knowledge and skills, to strengthen and pr uh, the provision of individual support and guidance, and to clarify the principles of providing basic education. 
Firstly, the mission and integrity of basic education involves citizen skills needed in the society and the individual futures. At the same time, they highlight deeper learning, learning goals and high order skills. Citizen skills are tools which support deeper learning and applied knowledge. They have been classified into five groups, thinking skills, ways of working and interaction, crafts and expressive skills, participation and initiative, and self-awareness and personal responsibility. In the legislat legislation that will be next, the next step in the renewal process, the citizen skills will be defined and combined with the objectives set for each multidisciplinary subject group, as well as the subjects these comprise of. The assessment criteria will also be uh, defined. The high level of skills and knowledge provided by basic education should be ensured also in the future. This requires that the goals of knowledge and skills are defined at high level, the citizens' knowledge and skills are st strengthened, that the welfare and functionality of the pupils and school communities are taken care of and that their uh, resources are ensured. The implementation of the mission of basic education in a changing operational environmental uh, require, uh, environment requires bringing together the core contents of focusing on the important issues so that there is place for practicing knowledge and skills. Secondly, the committee proposes that the national core curriculum for basic education should consist of, of compulsory and optional subjects. These would be defined as multidisciplinary subject groups and different subjects as their components. According to the proposal, uh, there would be six different multidisciplinary subject groups. Each uh, multidisciplinary subject group and subject follows the general national objectives for basic education. Specific objectives that will combine the general objectives and core contents will be defined for each multidisciplinary subject group, taking into account the present core content. In addition to grouping subjects, the committee proposes two new school subjects, ethics and drama. Ethics to, uh, is to reinforce the basic values of the Finnish society and to enhance a dialogue amongst pupils repre representing uh, different worldviews. The objective for drama is to strengthen a comprehensive approach to art education. In order to support the development of the pupils' identity and growth in a versatile way, the multidisciplinary subject groups, art and crafts, and health and personal functionality will be emphasized. It has been proposed that the minimum number of lesson hours and the number of optional lesson hours will be increased in arts and crafts and physical education in particular. The increase aims to give pupils more opportunities to different op options in these subjects. One of the challenges in Finland is that while internationalization is a priori priority uh, and schools are internationally active, most pupils learn English as their first foreign language. This means that too few pupils learn other languages, such as French, German, Russian, and Spanish. The committee proposes that the objective for language education is to strengthen the language skills in the society, diversify language programs, and introduce it earlier, as well as to ensure the position of second national language. The implementation of foreign language education and study studies in the second national language as well as the opportunity to choose amongst them in an equitable manner will be strengthened with national guidance. Foreign language education and second national language studies will be diversified and introduced earlier than today. The education provider's duty to offer a diversified language program will be specified. The education provider must offer at least three alternative languages of which one is the second national language. Instruction in a language must be provided if there are at least 10 pupils who have chosen that language. Thirdly, the committee emphasizes that in order to gain a good educational base to pro provide opportunities for individual growth in a versatile way, develop knowledge-based skills and be success successful as a learner, the pupils' knowledge and skills must be taken into account. This includes knowledge and skills acquired outside the school, each pupil must be provided with guidance and support, the, the support they need. 
the guidance should motivate pupils to find and develop their own strengths as well as be motivated by their own learning. The proposal aims to enhance pupils' freedom to choose optional lesson hours in an equal and equitable manner. The number of optional lessons, uh, lesson hours will be increased significant, significantly in grades 3 through 9. The increase aims to strengthen the objectives set for the multidisciplinary subject groups as well as integrate and deepen their content. Also, this aims to give pupils and um, education providers more opportunities for different options and flexible solutions as well as to increase the motivation to study. Finally, the committee proposes that basic education will be de developed as an integral whole by combining the three dim dimensions, objectives, contents and implementation in a systematic way. The guidance system will similarly be developed to support basic education as an integral whole. The objectives for the skills and competences and, and individual needs in the society have been classified into five groups. Thinking skills, ways of working and interacting, crafts and expressive skills, participation and in initiative, self-awareness and personal responsibility. These above mentioned skills, named citizen skills, will be defined as part of the general national objectives by the new basic education degree. They will be included in the objectives of the multidisciplinary subject groups and the objectives of individual subjects. The committee underlines that the implementation of the objectives for basic education requires a national and comprehensive agreement of the aims of the reform. Further, a clar clarification of the principles of implementation and support for the education providers will be necessary in order to implement the renewal and provide instructions according to the objectives. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Johan. There's a reason Johan is here. Uh, Finland has one of the most successful urban education systems in the world, and I know people will be beating down the door to find you afterwards to have that conversation. Just want to take a brief moment uh, to welcome Commissioner Jeannie Mulgrave of the City of New York's Department of Youth and Community Development, and we're so delighted she's here, and I'm just warning her in advance. I hope our international delegates particularly find her. Uh, we have, I would say, the most innovative Department of Youth and Community Development, I want to say, in our nation, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say the globe. Uh, she works very closely with our Department of Education and has pioneered programs uh, in after school at the school as well as in community organizations which both support the school day and encourage students to develop um, socially and emotionally. See Jeannie you taught me something. Thank you for being here and of course uh, to my students you're looking for internships find her right away. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our third panelist Mamta Rani Agarwak, who is the Director of Education at the New Delhi, New Delhi Municipal Council since May 2008. The New Delhi Municipal Council um, provides primary and senior secondary education within New Delhi, so Mamta really covers everything. I'm not sure how you do this job, but I know you'll be telling us very shortly a very challenging and difficult job in which she has been a tremendous innovator. Her initiatives include the development of a system-wide processes for academic and administrative bodies to improve efficiency following external evaluation of the public education system. I know our mayor would be delighted to talk to you about those initiatives. There are many similar ones that we're pursuing in New York City. Ms. Agarwala was previously the Deputy Director of the National Institute of Open Schooling, the largest open school in the world, and she served as a flight lieutenant in the Indian Air Force from 1995 to 2001. Maybe that's why you can do that job. She received a Master's of Science in Organic Chemistry from Osmania University. Welcome.
Good morning, my dear friends. Honorable Mayor of the New York City, for inviting me here, I wish to thank him. Former Mayor, President of the Columbia University, President of New York Global Incorporation, dignitaries on the dais, academicians, educators, administrators, and my fellow participants. It is indeed my privilege and honor to address gathering on an international forum. I have to initiate my conversation with two confessions. One, a sincere apology to Ms. Carla Stewart, one of the organizers, who kept on persuading me to prepare a very well-organized write-up, and, and I still decided that I shall speak on the subject extempore, as somehow I am not used to a very organized uh, write-up on any subject. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, I sincerely believe that each one of you present here is much more experienced, much more aware of the subject than what I am. I shall still express my views share my personal experiences, whatever I have gathered on the subject, an immensely important one, and that is education. Success is very, very subjective. I shall take a very personal example here. After doing my grade 12, that is senior secondary, and before graduating to a graduate college, I was not allowed to continue my studies for two years. And the reason, a lady from a marginalized community, it is not considered appropriate to attend colleges. And today, I stand before all of you, and I feel this is what education do, and that is what education empower a person. Education is a very, very wide subject, a very, very wide word, which is differently understood across the context, be it political, societal, or anything. I shall restrict myself to what I understand education is. To me, education is a way of life, or if I may say it is life itself. How do all individuals react to different situations? What is their degree of taking responsibilities for their own actions, their ethical standards, moral values, community belongingness? Responsibility as a citizen, everything is about education. And this is the education which they receive from their families, community, society, formal schooling system, surroundings, nations, and so on. However, I shall restrict myself to a meaning of education in the formal schooling system context, and that is that schools should impact students in a manner or should impart such education that children can go out physically fit, academically sound, emotionally well-balanced, morally correct, professionally competing, responsible citizens. I shall be covering my topic broadly into very briefly touching upon the way education system is in India local approach and challenges, and two vital aspects where I changed the system and really saw a measurable change in our education system. In India, education is from kindergarten to grade 12. Kindergarten and nursery are semi-formalized, and it is not really required to go to a particular school. Class 1 to class 12 are, again, Primary is class one to class five. Middle school is six to eight. Secondary is nine, grade nine and 10. And senior secondary is grade 11 and 12. It is a matter of union as well as the states. Funding comes from federal, state, and even private partnership. You will be surprised to know that by 2012, the private education industry in India is expected to be 75 billion US dollar. 75 billion US dollar. It's a huge number. 
because we are a country of billion plus population and our young population is 550 million now the things the changes which i made i will only be concentrating on those changes when i took over i realized that most of my clientele was from lower socio economic background where the parents were not able to be integrated in the learning process of their children and i realized that unless parents educators and administrators decide that their goals are common and their children are required to achieve those goals in close coordination nothing can be achieved so i made it mandatory it was very very difficult but i just persuaded and addressed all the parents telling them a lie i'm repeating telling them a lie that if they attend these mandatory workshops on parenting it will be added on to the grades of their children <laughs> which was untrue but believe me it worked <laughs> really it worked i i made all the parents and teachers realize that their parents are their children i'm sorry are the most important ones and their goals are the shared ones i had to very very aggressively consistently and progressively make my teachers understand my educators understand that you might be more educated academically more sound but it is parents who know their children better because i do not know how many children are there in a class in united states but it is only for few minutes even the best possible teacher can pay undivided attention to a child i had to make them understand that even if parents disagree with educators you have to take their view in consideration i had to make my educators understand that even if the child is not performing see you will have to involve parents you have to take them on board and believe me it worked i had to have and i personally had consistent workshops for my teachers to change the attitude believe me i i am not too sure how is it in united states but there i literally had to tell my teachers that please do not consider yourself academically so superior than most of the parents and if, especially if they are stay stay home parents they can still be most valuable partners so that is one thing which i have done and believe me my result in past one year the first year it went up by 12% the second year it went by 16.4% that is one thing which i have done secondly competency of the teachers see in the competency of the teachers i very clearly categorized that there are three aspects attitude skill and knowledge and i realized right in that hierarchy that i had to primarily change their attitude and then we graded our teachers and we realized wherever the schools were low performing there we made a change in the teachers that is and not the 100% change we just transferred the teachers who were the most performing ones and made them work with some of the teachers who were the low motivators or the teachers who were not as motivated and believe me it worked and primarily we really really delegated lot of responsibility in our principal allowed him to behave to control and to be responsible for the particular school in that local context that is whatever was available with the school but with greater responsibility with greater transparency and with greater accountability and i think these two small changes primarily integration of parents and when you integrate the parents their emotional aspect children may come from home which are broken they come from single parent homes they come from homes where there is no support available integrating those parents locating those parents integrating them in the formal education system and then continuously increasing 
the competency of my teachers, and so much more in attitude than the skill and knowledge. And I think it made a huge difference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mamta. I'm sure that uh, for the principals in the audience here, much of what you said resonated with them. Uh, the importance of engaging parents and making sure that teachers understand the value of parents in the education process, I think is something that every education system in the world uh, needs to recognize and, and struggles with. Finally, our last panelist before we open the floor to questions is Yin Hu Jing, who is the Deputy Director General of the Shanghai Municipal Education Commission. Currently, that job entails a quite a complicated uh, set of responsibilities. Um, he has done this job since 1980 in Shanghai, but he comes with an extraordinary set of credentials and also educational experience in the field. Mr. Yin has worked in the divisions for basic education and social development for the Pudong New Area of Shanghai. He also serves as a national school inspector and is a member of an expert group on curriculum reform for the Ministry of Education. He is vice chair of the Shanghai Education Council and holds professorships in each China Normal University and Shanghai Normal University. He was formerly a high school senior teacher and he studied Chinese language and education management at the College of Educational Management in East China Normal University and holds a bachelor's degree and a graduate degree in Chinese language. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to New York City and to this conference today. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm from and in 20 years in Shanghai, I'm from Shanghai. I'm very honored to be here. I will tell you all about the situation in Shanghai. The, the Shanghai is, is, is facing uh, many changes externally. The globalization uh, made the opening up and a very, very extensive uh, exchange, informalization and so forth requirements for teaching methods by changing the ways of knowledge production and stimulation. Internally, in the 1990s, Shanghai has implemented the, the education standardization policy, the environment we have to change it dramatically, but the, uh, the need has changed as well. Right now, the citizen has high requirement for the high quality citizen education. It has been demonstrated the trend for change in the last 20 years. The population of urban in the urban area has been from million people to 10 million people. Due to the population increase, such edu education environment change requires us to, to change, to take out any active measures from the perspective of common development believe uh, between our city and people. So how to make education working toward the fairness and excellence to promote the reform in education, uh, basic education. In the turns of the uh, century, we have uh, implemented the basic educational change in Shanghai because we find our curriculum reform is, is the 
we have to consider the reality futures and uh, uh, right now we have to develop uh, the advantage we have to overcome the shortcoming of our education for the student facing the futures. Unlike uh, United States and European country, uh, we have solid knowledge. We have a, have a lot of uh, learning experiences. But right now, this kind of students uh, is weak in crea creativity and uh, weak in uh, exploration and critical thinking. Therefore, our new uh, curriculum reform, we have uh, emphasized not only on the basic knowledge, we have uh, uh, not only have a basic uh, uh, type of the uh, curriculum, and also we have a, a three type of the curriculum, basic type and expansion types and research type. The expansion type uh, of curriculum, they have uh, is aimed at the develop their potentials. Uh, and the research type of curriculum to lead students to uh, find out the question uh, to uh, more problem solving skills to research and cooperating uh, the awareness for the for all students in the, that is an elective course with limited access for all students so as this as a base for all students uh, to reach basic standard, we have a unified standard. The Shanghai uh, curriculum reform is the standards, is the bottom line quality. Many students can have a proper effort to reach certain standard. We have strictly implement uh, to uh, eliminate the gap between students. We have to run good schools and to uh, enhance the education quality. We have to run good schools because certain uh, factors are uh, geographic difference and the history, history, uh, historical and traditional uh, uh, factors. There was different gap in terms of the education quality especially Shanghai, as facing many urban and rural differences. So the high quality uh, rural, uh, urban uh, schools have many resources. However, in school in the rural area, they don't have enough resources. I thought, I said Shanghai in the last 20, uh, Shanghai increased eight to nine million people. Therefore, we have a lot of new students. So do those new population uh, increase our population, accounted for 70% of our new students. Therefore, in our new city, our entire city, the outsider has accounted for the military, uh, military uh, uh, Forty-eight percent of the, our entire uh, educational uh, population. Therefore, we have to enhance the education quality in a rural sub, uh, suburban schools. We have to let us uh, employ good principle to lead those schools. Uh, because good principle can bring out good uh, good students and the management and the lead, uh, leading uh, all those uh, school curriculums and the relationship. This is, this is the key uh, to enhance the school quality. A good school, can, we can group the certain uh, uh, good school and to manage uh, those uh, schools with uh, lower quality. Secondly, and we have to implement the school delegated administration. In 2002, uh, we have implemented delegation administration with the, for those schools uh, with the lower uh, quality dedicated to uh, high quality school for uh, to those. So those delegated administration uh, already breaks through uh, the current uh, uh, shortcoming and the obstacles, and uh, we integrate uh, those uh, resources across uh, regions to, to achieve uh, such result.
Uh, the uh, pairing uh, program between the city and the county school uh, districts. In Shanghai, we have 18 districts. We, so far, we have uh, nine re, uh, rural county school districts uh, paired with uh, nine city districts, changing ideas, helping each other, implement reforms, and uh, innovative ideas to achieve mutual beneficial uh, benefits so that uh, the uh, City uh, education system to a uh, education system in rural areas. And number three, improve the teaching and the searching system. Uh, the Michael Spar Sparkly speaking, uh, you want to enhance teaching, you have to have uh, a well-established system to allow the specialized uh, professional bodies to enforce uh, the change. So as a, a government, we uh, to help the research and the teaching office. Uh, teaching and the research office is a body through which uh, governments uh, and uh, educational administrations uh, to provide guidance on teaching. In China, the teaching and the research systems has been around for 61 years. It has played an important part ensuring the quality best uh, education in China. The, the measures that we are taking are followed. Number one is to set up a teaching and the research networks over three levels. Number two, emphasize on customized teaching and the research systems for each individual schools so that uh, each uh, teacher uh, can participate in their own uh, teaching and uh, research office to focus on their individual needs of uh, every school and to reform uh, the teachings at uh, each individual school where they are at so that uh, the office is uh, supporting each school and each class in the school. Uh, and uh, so that uh, to improve the level of teaching. Number three is changing the process of teaching and the research work. Now we set up a citywide uh, system. Uh, we want to uh, provide the ways uh, to uh, send our message of teaching and research guidance, uh, establish an uh, internet-based uh, teaching and the research communication. And uh, we want uh, uh, to uh, train our uh, te uh, teacher because we want to change the best practice of teachers. And uh, number four, we want to strengthen the communication for teachers. Uh, first, we deliver the uh, continue education for all teachers. Uh, what we required, uh, AV teachers uh, has to go through 240 hours of training programs every five years, respectively, of which 50% shall be in school. Number two, training program for teachers in the rural areas. 30, establish a citywide education resources uh, alliances. We attract uh, the uh, best uh, professors uh, and uh, the best uh, uh, teachers uh, from the primary school and the secondary school to uh, form a teacher alliance and to pro provide a guidance for Shanghai uh, education system. Thank you so much. Uh, Yin, uh, that's an extraordinary um, presentation you've made. Uh, I know your responsibilities for almost 10 million students in the Shanghai metropolitan area is uh, something that even those of us in New York who think we have a big challenge which with our 1.1 million public school students uh, can appreciate what you have to deal with. Um, I think the recommendations you make were extremely helpful to everybody in the room. Um, I'm going to ask audience members who are interested in addressing our panelists to come up to the microphones uh, to ask them their questions, and I'll call on you. And I just request that you have a question as opposed to making uh, an editorial comment, although I know that since we are a group of educators here, I do expect there to be some breaking of the rules and some comments. Um, so I won't, I won't take the chair's prerogative to ask my question since we have members of the audience who are interested in uh, asking questions, but I might jump in and do that in a couple of minutes. Why don't we start with you and please identify yourself, uh, your name and your profession and what country you're from. Hello, uh, my name is Richard Reynolds. I'm from the School of International and Public Affairs and um, I'm from Massachusetts, the United States. As a former New York City teaching fellow, and one who taught English in the Bronx for two years, 
I witnessed firsthand the effects of parental involvement um, on education. In fact, ETS in 2007 uh, cited the lack of parental involvement as the biggest factor affecting um, public education. In this country, actually recently in Detroit, they've, had, they've taken measures to uh, put forth an incentives-based program to increase parental involvement. Uh, other states have talked about mandates. This is particularly directed towards MOMTA. What measures are taken uh, in your country to increase parental involvement and um, how do you measure, how do you track the progress and its direct impact on uh, the lives of children student and student academic achievement? I'm going to ask Mamta, Mamta to please start and then Claudia also please respond and then we'll take the next question. You want me to respond? When we started with the project of integrating parents, we started with certain pilot schools. We did not go ahead straight away. What did we do is we made certain things mandatory. That parents-teacher interaction, we made it mandatory. Certain times in some of the schools, it wasn't mandatory and it was not at regular intervals. Then we always informed our parents when was going to be the interaction so much well in advance when other than informing them that when is suppose we told them that the interaction is going to the 15th of next month we also either we either the teacher personally spoke to the parents sent them the ma mail wherever was the possibility that the areas where what are the areas which they are going to discuss with the parents if it was about uh, any behavioral aspect, if it was about academic progress, if, if it was about discipline in the class, if it was about any learning difficulty. Similarly, while deciding everything, whether it was eligibility age for a child to go to school, it was the learning aids which were to be used in the school, it was about anything, parents were taken on board. When we started this in the five schools initially, we realized that all of a sudden, the result started going better. The, there was a t more attendance rate. Children who were not even completing their homework, they were doing their homework. So a lot of small little things, there were 50 measurable parameters. Attendance rate, they're doing homework, they're uh, uh, difficult subjects such as mathematics, maybe sciences, how, how, how did they uh, perform to that? And when we realized that these five schools have become better, and I just want to tell you that, which I could not cover in my speech, we have got our schools accredited by Quality Council of India. It is a national agency for accreditation. We realized these were the first five schools which were accredited. And the accreditation parameters are absolutely measurable, 50 parameters. For example, what is the percentage of result? What is the percentage of attendance? So, so this is how we did it. address that. Uh, we don't have time for follow-up, unfortunately, because there's just too many questions. But I would like Claudia to address that yes. briefly. Uh, well, parental involvement is an issue in Brazil because most parents have less years of schooling than uh, their kids. Uh, we did research on that in 2008, and we discovered that they over uh, evaluate, they, they evaluate very favorably the schools of their kids, uh, although quality is really an issue. So what we did in Rio very quickly in one year and 10 months, uh, we first, we prepared a booklet on how to be a great mom, <laughs> you know, because we have single families and uh, how to be a great mom in what relates to school. It was, we hired some- I noticed you picked mom and uh, not dad. Uh, yes, yes. We did different things with dads, but with moms, a specific booklet written by journalists that know the language of classes, D and E uh, moms. And, uh, and it was very helpful with meetings to read to illiterate parents, uh, 
what to, to do because we were reestablishing homework. Homework was not a practice anymore in, in Rio, so we reestablished homework. We wanted parents uh, to be able to make sure that kids have the proper setting for that and uh, school attendance and so on. Second, there, there is something in, re, in uh, Brazil that is called Bolsa Familia, which means it is as if an, a scholarship that the family received uh, based on school attendance. But the conditionalities were very low, so we enforced conditionalities, and if a kid doesn't uh, go 90% of classes uh, uh, in a bimester, the kid loses this scholarship, which is means, uh, for, and then he must, he can receive it again if he continues go. But if the parent doesn't go to meetings, uh, either one of the parents also, they lose this kind of scholarship for two months. In addition to that, we created a school of par for parents, spe uh, specifically for early childhood. Uh, we want to make sure that even parents that don't say and send kids to early childhood centers, that they get the proper orientation, the proper guidance on how to nourish, uh, nourish, nourish and nurture babies. So, uh, and they receive even books to read to their kids. E even if they are illiterate, they, they are taught how to deal with books for uh, kids. Um, and last but not least, just one final thing. With the schools of tomorrow, with those violent areas, three mothers work in each school just to be a pacifier present, a pacification mm -hmm. presence during recess to avoid bullying, to escalate to something yeah. even more violent. I'm going to take the next question. Thank you very much. That was, both of you, very helpful response. Yeah, thank you. Todd Levinson from the SEPA school here at Columbia, uh, from California. Um, there's been many references to the quick changes that are occurring in the world, uh, both in the workplace as well as socially. And so I'm wondering what, what kind of reforms uh, you do in regards to making sure that, that school systems remain relevant and effective in meeting these changes. Um, both in, in meeting the current change, the, the current uh, workplace and social needs now, but also changes that allow it to adapt quickly as changes have become quick. Okay, so that's more of a, in a way, a management question too about how do you adopt, adapt rather quickly to change. Yeah. I'm going to ask um, Johan and Yin to uh, respond to that question. Thank you. Um, yes, the school systems change very slowly. Uh, which means that you can't actually do anything uh, fast. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. um, uh, the things that we, we know today and the things we're changing today, they will be in four or five years, they will be reality in the schools. So I don't actually have an, a good answer how we can, can we? Yeah, maybe we can. because your system works so well, you don't worry as much about change as the rest of us. Uh, um, I think that's one of the secrets as well. We don't change too much all the time <laughs> um, and too fast. It's an important point. Yin? Uh, yeah, the, the, the a school a system change is very uh, slow and difficult. But uh, you, if you want to make a change, you have to change your teachers. Just as uh, as m I'm uh, indicated in my uh, speech, uh, the advantage of Chinese education uh, uh, is uh, uh, to try uh, uh, to provide the students with basic education, but uh, uh, we don't provide uh, critical thinking for students. So that's the reason when we make a reform, we have to make a, a curriculum a reform. But the reform has to be carried out by teachers. Therefore, we have to make uh, substantial uh, changes on uh, teachers. In recent survey, 26% uh, of students uh, feel the changes.
we made. But that means uh, 74 percent of students haven't felt the changes we uh, implemented. I feel that uh, even though only 26 percent of students uh, felt the uh, reform benefits, uh, you know, just like I say that uh, we emphasize on the uh, research uh, security uh, in innovative uh, curriculums. I feel that at least it's a progress. As long as we insist, I feel that uh, eventually majority of students will feel the benefits. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Michelle Cahill, who is, um, was part of the mayor's reforms in the first administration at the Department of Ed and the creator of the small high schools in New York, a highly successful, extraordinary program, and who's here as part of our conference today. And I know you have a question. I have a quick question. Uh, from particularly directed to Ms. Coxton. An innovation that you mentioned that I think is really intriguing is that in your schools of tomorrow, in those most challenged neighborhoods, you focused on science. And yet you had talked about the students being, a large proportion of them being illiterate. And our President Obama has been talking about what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math as a driver of reform, and I wondered how you got to that, and then how did it work out? Go ahead. Okay, um, let me be quick. Uh, we first, we separated the kids that were illiterate. We trained our teachers very quickly and prepared them to re-alphabetize those kids. So those kids were, were sent to a different track the, it was 14% 14, 14 of the kids on those grades, four, fifths, and six. Mm -hmm. So it was an issue, but it was something that we can uh, address separately. The science approach was related to three things. First, to make going to school fun every day, interesting. If you teach science, the correct way. I'm talking about uh, elementary school and middle school. Uh, it's, it's amazing. We have in the schools of tomorrow, we ask the kids, what do you dream to become when you grow up? Because we don't want them to dream to become drug dealers. So uh, most of them say we want to be soccer players. That's Brazil. Huh? <laughs> uh, but uh, Growingly, they, they say, I want to become a scientist. I want to become an engineer. I don't know if they will, but that they, they think something out of their peculiar box. And so uh, it was uh, really something that changed, that school attendance is increased and, and they are having fun. And on the other hand, it, work, it deals with developing an investigative mind, you know, and that helps with Portuguese and math as well. Thank you. I'm going to ask our last two questioners to just quickly articulate the questions, and then everybody will get one last chance uh, to respond to either of these questions. Um, Susan Crawford, member of the two million parentocracy of New York City. And out of my experiences with my dyslexic kids, I formed something called the Right to Read Project. And Ms. Costin has just answered what was done in, in the schools of tomorrow, so that's covered. But because there's a cross-section of languages here, I'm especially interested to know what you do in your, each of your countries. Dyslexia affects 20% of the population across the world, but it affects different languages differently. It's, it's worse, it's the worst in English. So I'm just curious to know how you address it. Okay. Dave, David Allen from an organization called New Jersey Seeds, which works with low-income students here, high-achieving low-income students. My question is for Ms. Costin, but first I just want to say to Mr. Ora, I was just deeply inspired by the reform in Finland on, and the emphasis on ethics and acting. I think that's just really exciting. Um, Ms. Costin, my question is for you. The issue of, uh, of, um, uh, of performance incentives for teachers is very controversial here. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the reforms and how it worked and what you did. Well, the incentives issue applies to a number of the cities we've talked about. So I'm going to take this last question also, and then everybody can pick which question they want to answer. Thank you. 
My name is uh, Vivian Loschet. I'm uh, the wise mayor of the city of Luxembourg, but I am also graduated in uh, educa uh, education science. My question is because you told the fourth of you about things which should change the school system, things which are not only in relation with uh, knowledge. In uh, my city, we create um, an, uh, a communal program, action program, to put in network all the politics concerning children. And the most difficult was and still is to uh, englobe the schools, the primary schools, in this networking. We try to tell the, the teachers that it's not only knowledge, but we said in French, le savoir-faire et le savoir-vivre, which means knowledge of being, knowledge of, of uh, doing, that it's also part of the uh, education system, of the school system, but it's very difficult. You were talking about parents, about arts, about theater, about hurls, about all these things. Do you, are you also the same meaning, have you also the same meaning that education it's in fact not only school it's also the things around the schools and the, that the school in the new school system should open more okay. and include uh, the other politics inside thank you thank you very much for your question uh, we're going to begin with yin and everybody will take uh, very brief responses to any of those three questions pick one answer the question uh, uh, when you uh, the, uh, when uh, this gentleman asked uh, about uh, the, uh, how uh, what teach uh, the parents uh, play a role in case, uh, education we are facing two kind of uh, parents uh, one irresponsible parents uh, they uh, the family, uh, the life is uh, adversary uh, to the uh, learning of uh, parents. Uh, so as an uh, educator, we have to communicate to uh, the parents uh, and to how uh, the parents to uh, create an environment where uh, students can learn. The other is uh, the overbearing parents. They spend all the time on their kids. They spend every minute they send their parents to uh, uh, kids to play pianos and uh, to learn paintings. Uh, we have a lot of overbearing parents. We have to tell them, I say, please get them a break. <laughs> Education uh, is, uh, uh, needs to focus on the morality of a uh, human being. Okay, we emphasize uh, that to the overbearing uh, parents. Uh, and this is uh, my point of view. Uh, I don't know whether uh, whether uh, you sh uh, share with me. I feel that education is uh, not only confined in school, but also uh, reach to parents. Thank you. Thank you. I will answer to the question of Vice Mayor of Luxembourg. Uh, yes, I completely agree that schools uh, are not only about academics. So I'm sure as everywhere is, even in my country, everything, be it theater, arts, music, vocal, non-vocal, sports, everything is part of the curriculum which is designed, it is part of the lesson plans, it is part of what, whatever is to be covered in the entire annual year. The second, uh, second aspect is how do we do it? In my country, since most of the children come from extremely lower socioeconomic background, especially in public schools, the case is not so in the private schools, we have launched a program known Lakshya, which in my language means target. Where, wherever the children are extraordinary, in whatever they are extraordinary, it can be that uh, they are extraordinary in uh, uh, taking a technical subject, they are extraordinary in playing uh, violin or anything. We take care of them. Uh, uh, this is a, a, there is an ability section, which we in our language call Lakshya, that is target. We take care of everything from after grade 12, their counseling, to their uh, teaching, to their uh, uh, training, uh, and, and every financial aspect, every, every kind of aspect is taken care by us. 
So that is, uh, uh, there are where we are not able to integrate as a state, we take care of everything. Thank you. Uh, Johan and Claudia, quick. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to be quick. Um, how we, I'm going to answer the question how we deal with the students who have dyslexia. Um, in Finland, we start with early intervention, which means we test all the students in, in before they start school, actually, and in the, grade, in the first grade. So we try to find out if they have some kind of problems. And if they do have, they will get individual support. Uh, in every school, we have a special education teacher who can give that to, to the student. Um, we also have personal assistance, which means that there could be in the classroom at the same time with the teacher, a co-teacher who will take care of these kids who have special needs. Thank you. Okay, so I'll answer the performance uh, incentives. Uh, uh, you know, there, I don't know uh, how is it in, uh, in, the, in New York and other cities in the States, but there are lots of charming projects that surround schools, people who offer interesting <laughs> p p projects or focus on school buildings, wonderful buildings with swimming pools and so on. And school is about learning. So uh, the school must open itself to many things, but it is about learning. If, if ki kids don't learn to read, write, to, uh, to learn computing, uh, mathematics, I mean, I, uh, they won't be good citizens because they won't read the papers, they won't make their own decisions. So first thing, uh, we evaluate schools based on kids learning. And we decided not to compare schools, but to set targets for schools to be better than themselves. So to improve learning compared to their past. Uh, so that we don't compare a school in a violent slum with a school in middle class neighborhood. And uh, so each, each school signed a contract, a kind of contract that has no necessarily legal binding, but uh, it is a, uh, a contract. And based on that contract, all the team, all the members of the team that are not, that were, uh, were not absent that year, that school year, they receive a prize in money if they reach that target. Uh, that car tar uh, the money they received is enhanced if they work in a school to of tomorrow, but it's an important money for them. Uh, it builds on, on team, being a team player, so it's not that f the fifth grade teacher receives and not the fourth grade. The, the, the requirement to receive the prize is kids' improvement and not being absent more than five times that school year, even on legal grounds. Uh, if the mother had a baby that year, it's very happy she will receive the whole salary but not the prize. The prize is for the teachers that, uh, you know, we say in, per, in Brazil, who held the piano that year, who had the burden to work extra hours because the other was, were not uh, present. That's how our system works. Thank you very much. What an extraordinary panel. You've all been amazing, and we're delighted that you could join us this morning.